This is our Canadian payload specialist, Roberta Bonder. She represents the Canadian Space Agency. And she is seated next to our uh, Ulf Morabold, who is our uh, representative from the uh, e European Space Agency. Norm Thaggard is uh, one of our mission specialists. And this is our commander, Ron Graby. Seated next to another mission specialist, David Hilmers. And our final two members this morning are Bill Reedy and our pilot, Steve Oswald. First shown here is our commander, Ronald Graby. Uh, he will be preparing for his third flight in space this morning. Next to Graby is uh, one of our payload specialists from the European Space Agency, Ulf Merbold. Uh, he is a, a citizen of the country of Germany. And he will be making his second flight into space this morning. Our mission specialist Norm Thaggard is preparing to make his fourth flight into space today. And our Canadian payload specialist, Roberta Bonder. She'll be the only female on board this morning. She'll be making her first trip into space, but this will be the second for a Canadian payload specialist to fly aboard the shuttle. A fit check of the suits is important to make sure that the crews are not only comfortable, but that the uh, seals around the helmets are, are adequate. And our mission specialist, Dave Hilmers, who was uh, uh, somewhat of a uh, last minute addition. He is uh, actually uh, not, was not assigned to the original crew. He is replacing the late Sonny Carter, who was uh, killed in an accidental plane crash about a year ago. David Hilmers will be making his fourth flight into space today. And our mission specialist, Bill Reedy, making his first flight into space today. This is shuttle launch control. And we have our flight crew our seven-member crew who are making their way down the third floor level of the uh, operations and checkout building, making their way to the uh, elevator, standing by for the other two crew members to come around the corner so they can all ride down the elevator together. And here they come, our seven-member launch team, launch crew led by Commander Ron Graby and Pilot Steve Oswald, Mission Specialist Norm Thaggard, right, Bill Reedy and David Homers, and our two payload specialists, Wolf Marbo and Roberta Bondar. This is shuttle launch control at T minus one hour, 34 minutes and counting. And we are at T minus five minutes and holding. Uh, yes, sir, you have a go to proceed. I uh, copy, GLS, pick up the clock on your mark, please. And stored program command. Will go. And we will be transferring to orbiter internal power at this time. Discovery is now running off its onboard fuel cells. And the gaseous oxygen vent hood and arm is now slowly being retracted away from the top of the external tank. T-minus 45 seconds, coming up on a go for our auto sequence start. CLS is go for auto sequence. And we have a go for auto sequence start. T-minus 25 seconds. 20. 15. 12. 10. 
nine, eight, seven. We have a go for main engine start. We have three main engines up and running. Three, two, one, zero. And liftoff, liftoff of the Space Shuttle Discovery and the first International Microgravity Laboratory. Houston is now controlling. Discovery and Roo crew are rolling on course. Discovery roll program. Roger roll, Discovery. Roll maneuvers complete. Placing Discovery and crew heads down and on the proper heading. Engines at 100%. Engines throttling back now to 70% to help maintain optimum aerodynamic conditions as Discovery accelerates through the dense lower altitudes. All systems performing well. Engines throttled down and performing well. Good, good hydraulics, good electrical systems. Altitude now 23,000 feet. Three engines throttling back up. Three engines now at one, 104. Discovery Houston, your go throttle up. Check hot mic. Go throttle up. Discovery now traveling at over 1,000 miles per hour. Altitude 65,000 feet. Downrange distance 8 nautical miles. All systems performing well. Time 1 minute 33 seconds. Next milestone in its climb to orbit will be a uh, solid rocket booster burnout and subsequent staging at about two minutes, six seconds. And we have separation. Discovery now flying free of the boosters and under the power of its own main propulsion system. Second stage guidance now in control. Discovery now traveling over 2,800 miles per hour, altitude 178,000 feet, downrange distance 36 nautical miles. Discovery Houston, performance nominal. First stage now, performance nominal. First stage performance of the main engines and boosters was good. Altitude now, 200,000 feet, downrange distance, 47 nautical miles. All systems performing well. Discovery Houston, two engines, Zaragoza. Discovery Houston, press to Miko. Roger, press to Miko. Discovery now has enough momentum to make a normal insertion to orbit with only two engines should one fail. Three engines continuing to burn well at 104%. All systems performing well. Downrange distance now 306 nautical miles. Discovery Houston, single engine Zaragoza 104. Single engine Zara 104. Discovery Houston, we see a nominal Miko. No ohms one required. And your go for the ET photo DTO. This is Mission Control Houston. Activities in the activation procedures with the Space Lab module continue to go very smoothly. The crew has completed almost uh, 14 of the 16 steps. So far in the activation procedure, everything has gone very smoothly. There are no major problems that are being worked either with Discovery or with the Space Lab module itself. Controllers here in Houston are in the process of watching over the shoulder of Mission Specialist Norm Thaggard as he 
activate the laboratory. This is Space Lab Operations Huntsville. Showing activities which are currently underway with the BioRack experiment facility. And uh, that facility, of course, uh, supports 17 different experiments during the IML-1 mission. And at the moment, some activity underway on the experiment known as PROTO for short, a Danish experiment. Go ahead. Okay, Reverend Reiki's down. Let me give you the time. The M uh, MWP people said they wanted them. Uh, Ready to copy, man. just a minute. Uh, Ron, let's see what the uh, investigators want to do. We'll be right back with you. The BioRack science team from the European Space Agency is monitoring the uh, frog egg experiment here in our science operations area. On BioRack, there's some 17 experiments 14 of which have been contributed by the European Space Agency and three by the United States.
This particular experiment series uses equipment especially designed or modified for Space Lab. Looking okay. good. Looks like looks like Dave's feeling pretty good on the blink control now. That looks great. Principal investigators and co-investigators are watching with considerable interest. This is Space Lab Mission Operations in Huntsville. Payload Specialist Wolf Beerbowl and Mission Specialist Dave Hilmers have set up the SLED experiment. It is one of several space physiology experiments to be conducted during this seven-day Space Lab mission. There are three groups of experiments that make up CPF, or Critical Point Facility. One supplied by the United States, another by Holland, and a third by France. Okay, Huntsville, this is PS2 starting um, X Activity 3. At the present time, the crew in the Space Lab module are setting up the triglycine sulfate crystal growth experiment.
gas bridge that holds canisters is capable of holding 12 canisters at a time. Okay, we see that, Bill. Thank you. In these uh, three tubes on the mid-deck of Discovery, uh, each tube is about two inches on in diameter and 15 inches long. Uh, they're filled with different sized glass beads. Uh, one has beads a quarter millimeter in diameter uh, in it. The other one has beads uh, one millimeter in diameter in it. And uh, the third one has beads uh, two millimeters in diameter inside. Uh, the blue liquid that is moving through is uh, simply blue colored water uh, to study the action of that liquid, the capillary action as it moves through the porous medium of the glass beads. close-up view in this case of the IMAX 70 millimeter motion picture camera uh, as pilot Steve Oswald continues to uh, handle the IMAX camera
uh, conserving consumables that the folks on the ground are now officially extending your mission an additional day. Mission, additional deorbit opportunities available. You can help us with this by powering down a CRT per the execute package and turning off any other uh, non necessary equipment that you can find. Commander Ron Graby and pilot Steve Oswald are in the process of uh, helping controllers do some troubleshooting with the waste collection system. A little bit earlier this afternoon, uh, controllers noticed that uh, that system was not depressurizing as it should. So, uh, they're watching over the shoulder of uh, Commander Graby and Go ahead, Steve Oswald as they uh, as they re-zero the uh, valve control handle. who knew Sonny, echo your sentiments, and thank you for those memories of him. Thank you, Ray.
Discovery Houston, we're with you on Tedris West. Okay, we appreciate that. We'll give you some uh, uh, forward RCS uh, burn time, dump time of 50 seconds. And be advised, the secondary actuator check and hydraulic fluid thermal conditioning are not required. This is Mission Control. Flight Dynamics Officer reports at 90 degrees or halfway around the heading alignment cone. Uh, discovery is uh, nominal energy. Moving at about uh, 311 miles per hour, about 16,000 feet altitude. Discovery. Mission Control Discovery is now using uh, information from the microwave landing system. Discovery Houston, you're on glide slope on center line. Surface winds are calm. Altitude is uh, 3,400 feet, and the equivalent airspeed is about 3,300 miles per hour coming around the uh, final, uh, coming into the final approach. Landing gear is locked in place. Main gear touchdown. No nose gear touchdown as uh, STS mission mission STS 42 rolls out on runway 22 at an Edwards Air Force Base, California.
Roger, Discovery, and welcome back. Your mission has given us a preview of space station operations and a look at the international cooperation that will be a part of future space exploration. A nice job, Ron. Thanks, John. We sure all enjoyed it. This is Mission Control. The crew transport vehicle has uh, the crew all on board now, all seven members of the STS-42 crew, and uh, is preparing to pull away. And we'll uh, take the crew on over to the uh, Dryden crew quarter facility. We will be expecting to hand over Discovery to the ground operations managers uh, within the next few minutes. This is Mission Control. The STS-42 Flight Control Team has handed over the care and maintenance of the uh, Space Shuttle Discovery to the Ground Operations Managers at the Dryden facility. by for the President of the United States. Colonel Gravy, can you hear me? Yes, sir, Mr. President, we hear you loud and clear. What happened? Why, why did you... <laughs> can you guys hear me up there all right? We hear you loud and clear, Mr. President. Loud and clear. Let me just say uh, to Commander Gravy and all the rest of you all, we're, I'm here with a lot of the young astronauts and uh, some of the older astronauts, as a matter of <laughs> fact, four of, the, four of the crews here in the White House complex, and we just called up to wish you well. The Vice President is with me. Admiral Truly is with me. And uh, we just want to get from you all how it's doing down there. A lot of these kids want to get going and get out to Mars. And you got any advice, first of all, for these young guys here? Young kids, boys and girls? Well, certainly, Mr. President, for any uh, young astronauts that want to pursue a career as an astronaut, they ought to be emphasizing math and science in their studies and just doing as well as they can. Uh, it's a long, hard road to get there, and uh, it takes a little luck along the way as well, but it's certainly worth the effort. We've been talking a little bit about the contribution that these journeys make to science. Can you tell us a little bit about the, uh, in, in layman's terms, please, about the uh, experiments that you all are conducting? Well, sir, let me turn that over to Norm Tiger. He's our payload commander here on my right. Well, Mr. President, uh, taking the uh, experiments to orbit is an excellent way to do uh, experiments in some areas of science, and it makes uh, this whole journey well worthwhile. The two principal things that uh, are areas that come to mind are uh, physiology, both uh, plant and animal, and crystal growing, and uh, other uh, material science experiments. And we have some 55 experiments, I think, in the IML complement. Most of those are working even as we speak. And it is our plan to do some more TV, some more explanation later on about uh, some more details of that science. Well, that is very interesting. Now, if you guys have a couple of more minutes, we don't want to detract you from all this experimentation, but it might be fun if one of these young astronauts, or maybe a couple, would like to... Here comes my man. Uh, <laughs> he's back. This guy just gave a great speech here. Tell, what, tell him your name and see if you got a question for him. Hey, Michael Frisbee, and here's my question. What's it like in zero gravity? You get that? The question that we understood was what... Yes, sir, we understood the question that he wanted it like in zero gravity, and I'll turn that over to Bill Reedy, who's on Bob's left. That's great. Just floating around and everything. And uh, a lot of things, it just makes a whole lot easier. Aside from putting your pants on, both legs at 
same time, it's, uh, it's easy to translate back and forth and uh, makes it a whole lot easier to do a lot of the science because any particular orientation you choose works the same as uh, any other. <laughs> What's she doing? It makes it all very clear. Thank you. Um, <laughs> any other? You come on. You come up and ask one. This is a rare opportunity. Far away. Um, I wanted to know. Um, so can hear it. I wanted to know um, what was your favorite experiment you've taken up so far. Well, that sounds like a good question for Steve Oswald, our pilot, to answer. Steve's over here on Bill's left. Actually, I guess I'm not sure that being uh, able to front the bus we're working the experiments all that hard, but we've got the iMac camera board, and Bill and Ron and I have been having a great time taking those movies that, that you see on the big screen. Okay. And we're taking pictures right now for, uh, for a movie that'll be coming out here uh, within a year or two. young astronaut, this is the president speaking now, but I, I just want to say how, how pleased we are that uh, you representing Canada are a part, a fundamental part of this. I think it's a wonderful thing, and I think in a wonderful way it shows the strength of ties between our two great countries. So uh, I understand the prime minister, my friend Brian Mulroney, called. Did he actually get through the other day? Now we got. If you got time for one more question, we got a real eager one right here, front of the line. Here we go. Let's see if you can get so they can. I hear. wonder how you feel in space. I think the question was, how do we feel in space? Yeah. Well, in space, uh, it takes a little bit, a bit of time to get used to it. Um, this is when you first get up, you might feel just. Quite a bit queasy or so, but by about today, this is our third day in space. We're beginning to adapt pretty well. I think you can see we all feel pretty comfortable up here. So after you get over the initial adjustment, you can live in space quite well and do things that you do on Earth. I have a rather well, some of the uh, older astronauts. Some of the older astronauts are actually in space now, and uh, anything that can give you the enthusiasm that a kid has has got to be a great experience. And I feel like I'm about 12.
Well, we got, we got, you go see someone. You can have What planets have you seen? What planets have you seen? Well, of course, we got the, the world's greatest view of, of our world, but uh, on some of our night passes, we could see uh, Saturn and Jupiter and Mars and Venus. It's really spectacular up here. Hope we could go to uh, Mars here one of these days. Well, we're going to keep trying to get this program geared up to do just that, and maybe, just maybe, Colonel, uh, one of these kids here today will be a part of that. Sooner, maybe later, but I'll bet one of them will be a part of that mission. But listen, I'm told we gotta we gotta run on. But I uh, we got a lot of eager questioners. But unfortunately, I guess we don't have the time. But we certainly want to wish you well. Uh, your fellow astronauts are standing here uh, quietly in the shadows, and I know that they are wishing you well. The successful conclusion of this productive journey, and you have our blessings and our support. And uh, keep up the fine work. You're on the cutting edge, and you're setting a great example uh, for the rest of our country, the rest of the world. Congratulations, and thanks for taking the time out. Well, thank you, Mr. President. We certainly want to thank you for taking the time. We want to wish all the young astronauts luck in their careers. Well, the worldwide television audience for today's game is estimated at around 750 million people. But what about the audience out of this world? Joining us now live from the Space Shuttle Discovery in orbit some 163 nautical miles or 3,300 football fields above the Indian Ocean on the opposite side of the planet from Minneapolis, our shuttle commander, Ron Gravy. He is the gentleman in the... Uh, in the red skin hat. I wonder if he's pulling <laughs> part, Greg. Pilot Steve Oswald. Welcome to the Super Bowl today, gentlemen. Uh, tell us, we see a lot going on there. What are we looking at? Well, Greg and Terry, we're real happy to be with you. Uh, what you're looking at here is the Space Lab module that we have in the payload bay of the uh, shuttle Discovery. And let me call uh, some of our payload crew members, Norm Taggart and Roberta Bonder, up forward, and they can give you a little idea of what's been going on. Well, Greg and Terry, this is the Space Lab mission, and that means science, so we've uh, been performing one of our vestibular experiments, and we'll break away from that and join Ron, I guess. Well, tell me, gentlemen, let's get your thoughts on today's game since we've taken you away from your work temporarily. Well, actually, Greg, we were kind of hoping that Houston was going to be in today's game, but but it looks like you've got a couple of great teams that are going to go at it. We're just sorry that uh, we don't have a way of receiving the game up here. And besides that, NASA's keeping us a little busy today. I've got to ask you this. How in the world are you going to keep tabs on the game, find out who's winning? Well, we think Houston will keep us pretty well informed. <laughs> you hope so. Anyway, here, how, is a, how would a coin toss work in zero gravity? Would that present some problems? Well, we thought about that. We hoped you'd ask, so we have a little demonstration here. I'm going to give the coin to Roberta Bonder here. She's our Canadian payload specialist. She knows a little more about Canadian football than American football, but nonetheless, she's interested, and we'll see about a zero-G coin toss. <laughs> I don't suppose we should call heads or... Looks like his head, Greg. <laughs> Terry and Greg, as you can see in zero G, the coin never comes down, so we'll just have to defer the coin toss for the official pregame ceremony. Well, we hope they'll keep you advised of what's happening, and we sure appreciate you having taken time out of your busy schedule. We wish you uh, a terrific mission and uh, and a happy touchdown next Wednesday. Thanks very much. We're delighted to have taken part. And, uh, of course, we are looking for our fair share of touchdowns here today. Well, we've waited almost two and a half hours to say this. When we come back, our final thoughts. This is Colin from Commando.
sind wir bestrebt, gute Einkristalle herzustellen aus Materialien, die auch große praktische Bedeutung haben, als Röntgendetektoren oder Infrarotdetektoren. Und äh, ich bin persönlich optimistisch, dass äh, die meisten Experimente sehr gute Ergebnisse erbringen werden. Herr Meerbrüte, ist ja über die einzelnen Experimente hinaus eine großartige Sache, wie sich eine internationale Partnerschaft entwickelt hat. Eine Ihrer Kollegen wird in sechs Wochen zur sowjetischen, zur russischen Raumstation hier fliegen. Und äh, in einem Jahr werden wir die nächste D2-Mission haben. Wo sehen Sie eigentlich in der langfristigen Strategie aus der Distanz des Weltraums betrachtet die Möglichkeit, dass so eine internationale Zusammenarbeit hier uns helfen wird, auf der Erde friedlich zusammenzuleben und unsere Probleme zu lösen, die wir hier unten haben? Ja, das ist natürlich ein abendfüllendes Thema. Meine amerikanischen Freunde und Kollegen und ich genießen ja das Privileg, unseren Globus in 90 Minuten zu umrunden. Und da werden die einzelnen Länder, aus denen wir kommen, eigentlich sehr irrelevant. Es ist aus dieser Position sehr deutlich, dass wir auf einem Raumschiff durch den Weltraum fliegen, dem Raumschiff Erde. Und es ist deswegen unsere Überzeugung, dass es für uns alle die beste Verfahrensweise ist, wenn wir zusammenarbeiten, um die Probleme auf der Erde zu lösen. Und ich glaube, der Weltraum, der hat eine doppelte Bedeutung. Einmal eine philosophische, nämlich die Erkenntnis, dass wir alle zusammen durch den Sinn von Weltraum fliegen und das Zweite ist die praktische Bedeutung, dass wir vom Weltraum aus die globalen Zusammenhänge studieren können. Ja, wir wollen weiter in guten Flug, in guter Kameradschaft, mit guten der Wissenschaft und in einem guten Geist. Vielen herzlichen Dank. Discovery, this is Mr. Luton speaking again. Dr. Isenover has finished. Now I am speaking. My greeting to Commander Rave and to the SCS-42 crew. Thank you very much, Mr. Luton. We appreciate that. This is uh, an international flight, an international crew, and uh, we're very privileged to be a part of it. Discovery, six Europeans are flying this year in space. How do you feel about this? Well, I think uh, space is a unique place to do scientific experiments for various reasons. There's weightlessness for a very long period of time. There's no atmosphere. And uh, we also have a global view such that we can study our own home planet. And uh, therefore, I think uh, there's a tremendous potential for scientific experiments. We will soon reach the turn of the century. How do you see the next steps of ESA in space? Oh, the turn of the century, I think, um, from my personal point of view, that it is clear that we should uh, work together on a global scale, and uh, I'm a very privileged man that uh, I have already an opportunity now to fly in orbit with uh, the finest astronauts uh, of the United States of America. And uh, I think we, from a European point of view, can learn a lot from them. And uh, I feel personally that uh, we should intensify the cooperation because uh, we can learn a lot. And uh, if we uh, pull our potential, then um, I think we can accomplish a lot. Discovery, we see Mr. Luton speaking again. I have finished. It is time to conclude. Our best wishes of success for the STS-42 mission to the whole crew. Thank you, Commander Grab, and goodbye. Thank you very much, Mr. Luton. It's been a real pleasure. Discovery Houston, that concludes the call. Great job. Thank you. Thank you.
Thanks a lot. Discovery Houston, we've got a good downlink video of you. Are you ready for your call from Canada? Houston, Discovery is ready for the call from Canada. Toronto, Houston, please go ahead with your call. Discovery, this is Toronto for Commander Ron Gravy. Toronto, this is Discovery, Commander Ron Gravy speaking. Your voice quality is loud and clear. Good evening, Commander Gravy. This is Jay Ingram at the Ontario Science Centre in Toronto. Prime Minister Brian Mulroney is standing by in Ottawa. And the Minister for Science, William Weingart, is with me right beside me here in Toronto. Congratulations to you and all your crew on a very successful flight so far. Well, Jay, on behalf of the entire crew of IML-1, we'd certainly like to thank you. Uh, we have been very fortunate so far. The flight's gone very well. We're very pleased with that. Uh, at this point, I would like to turn things over to and introduce uh, Dr. Roberta Bonder. Uh, Good evening, Jay. Hello, Dr. Bonder. Uh, to start things off, the Right Honorable Brian Mulroney, the Prime Minister, is waiting in Ottawa, and he's ready to speak with you right now. Good evening, Roberta, and uh, congratulations on becoming Canada's second space traveler. As you know, this is a year of celebration in Canada, our 125th birthday, and your flight has captured the imagination of all of your fellow Canadians, probably in a way that you couldn't have imagined. And the success of this international mission has demonstrated to the world that Anything can be achieved with dedication and cooperation, and I'm delighted to have this opportunity to congratulate you on what you and your colleagues have achieved so far, and to wish you all well. Thank you very much, Mr. Prime Minister. It's been a deed and honor and a privilege to be on board this particular mission. Uh, we've had a great deal of science accomplished so far in this flight, and we still have a couple more days, we hope, uh, to be able to do a little bit more. We've enjoyed um, being with each other and working with each other and learning new things about the world and about uh, how we work and how we view science. And it's just been a, a fantastic experience, and I just can't wait to get back and start telling people all about it. Roberta, I spoke earlier today with Ken Money, who told me that you had spent a little time just studying countries as they went by. And I understand that you caught a glimpse of Canada during your mission. What struck you most during the site? Well, at uh, lunchtime today, I had a tape on, I had a cassette tape on at the front, and I actually had a recording of, uh, that I had recorded for me before I came up here, of old Canada, and I just happened to go up to the flight deck, and we were going right over Canada, and it was just fantastic. I, although it's wintertime, and we we're going over the northern part of Canada, we went uh, across the Northwest Territories, down across uh, into uh, Quebec and Ontario, and you could certainly go back and you could recognize all the land features. It was just absolutely fantastic. There were no, very, very few clouds around. And I must say that uh, for people who think that our country, when it's wintertime, is not exciting, let me tell you, it's exceptionally exciting uh, from space. Very, very clear. And uh, I just can't, and I, I, I wish I could just have a, a foot down and walk across every mile of this beautiful country because it just looks so exciting uh, from up here. It's just beautiful. Roberta, vous êtes dans l'espace depuis déjà sept jours. Est-ce que la vie dans l'espace est très différente de la vie sur Terre? Parce que vous venez de dire que un peu mon pays, c'est l'hiver. Oui, bien sûr, euh, il y a beaucoup de différences euh, dans l'espace. Par exemple, euh, pour euh, les repas, euh, si vous voulez, euh, c'est possible de manger le yogourt, par exemple, mais c'est possible dans l'espace de jouer avec la nourriture, euh, par exemple le, le, le yogourt, c'est comme ça. Avec le cuir. C'est pour euh, le repas, c'est nécessaire aussi de fixer euh, solidement sur euh, le mur, le plancher, le plafond. C'est n'importe quelle, euh, quelle surface, euh, on, peut, euh, on doit utiliser parce que c'est la, la même chose. Le mur, c'est la même que le c'est excellent pour la diète. La diète, 
This is uh, Jay Ingram again, Dr. Bondar. Thanks very much for taking the time to talk to us, and thank you also, Commander Gravy, for setting, si setting time aside for us to be able to talk to you both from Toronto here, William Weingart and myself, and for the Prime Minister, Mr. Mulroney in Ottawa. Thank you very much. Discovery Houston, we have good down leak video from the lab. You ready for the press conference on air to ground two? Houston Discovery, we're ready for the conference. Roger Discovery, stand by from the Marshall Press Center. Marshall, your go with your call. Discovery, this is the Marshall Press Center. We're ready to begin the press conference if you are. Good morning. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Uh, Bonder. We don't have too many Canadians in space, so I'd like to uh, start off with her. It's Mike Amelis from Broadcast News Canada. Dr. Bonder, I wonder if you could describe uh, those three hours sitting in the shuttle waiting to take off last Wednesday. What was it like? What were you thinking about? And then could you describe that ride up to the heavens? Broadcasting Corporation for Roberta Bonder. Roberta, we know how much you were looking forward to looking down at the planet and, and out to the stars. Can you share with us just what your thoughts and feelings have been as you've done that? Well, it's, uh, it's very, very difficult to describe, and I think that's what everybody says. My impression of the planet Earth is uh, that certainly the title of Blue Planet is a good one because the crisp, uh, shiny, bright uh, jewel that we have. We could see the limb of the earth when I uh, first got to the window. It was one of the first things I wanted to do. And uh, it was uh, very, very exciting for me to be able to look down. And when I first uh, came over Canada, it was the biggest thrill imaginable, winter or no winter. It has to be, it's just absolutely beautiful and spectacular. And I, I'm coming back to earth with a feeling that there is absolutely nothing boring. There is no boring place anywhere in this whole planet. Joanne Arcan de Radio-Canada, une question en français pour euh, le docteur Bondar. Euh, docteur euh, Bondar, les scientifiques semblent très satisfaits du travail que vous faites actuellement. Est-ce que c'est véritablement un défi de faire des expériences euh, qui ont été préparées par 200 scientifiques? And uh, Kevin Bissett from CFBC Radio in uh, St. John, New Brunswick. What's been the most difficult thing to adapt to in space? Okay, again, it's uh, Kevin Bissett from CFBC Radio in St. John, New Brunswick. Dr. Bondar, if you could uh, tell us what's been the most difficult thing to adapt to in, uh, in space. Uh, I think it took a couple of days for me to be able to 
get the hang of going between the space lab and the uh, mid deck uh, through the tunnel without becoming uh, totally disoriented. It's kind of a, a, a unusual feeling to come up from the mid deck into the space lab, and you think you're in one direction, you pop up into the space lab, and bingo, you're upside down uh, with reference to uh, verticals that we learned on Earth. Stephen Strauss from the Globe and Mail newspaper in Toronto. This is for Dr. Bondar. Um, I know you were working uh, on a book with your sister about the uh, the science of the IML mission. Um, what will you put in the book now or emphasize uh, having actually flown that um, you might not have put in before? Well, I've been uh, trying to keep uh, some rigorous notes and uh, a daily uh, diary on tape about some of the, the aspects of uh, doing science in space of the things that we need to not only tell the, the uh, young people who I hope will, will read the book, but also uh, our scientists who have to, who want to put on experiments in space flight. I also would like to include a little bit more about uh, daily living up here because it is fun. We've had a good time together and there are a lot of uh, little tricks that you learn up here and uh, a lot of experience that you can gain from others in terms of trying to make this a wonderful environment in which to live. Dr. Bonder, Yves Savory, uh, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. The question that you were asked in French, Dr. Bonder, you had said it was the biggest open book exam of your life. How has that played out? Well, it, uh, I, it was not an underestimation, let me tell you. When you first start up, uh, at least for me, here in the uh, space lab, we first started up the series of experiments, you work with plenty of palms because you know how much work the scientists have put into putting the experiments together. We only hope that the data that they're going to get back uh, from this space mission will be reflective of all our caring and effort that we put in up here. So in terms of uh, the open book exam, I hope that when we get back, we've all, we all get uh, four A's. My question will be directed to Dr. Bandar. My name is Réal Damour de Radio-Canada. Roberta, uh, vous avez uh, pratiqué, vous avez répété les expériences sur Terre pendant deux ans. Que ça se passe euh, comme prévu dans l'espace. Euh, bonjour, Réal. Est-ce que c'est possible de répéter la question? Euh, maintenant, euh, je, je pense que c'est possible de vous écouter. Roberta, bonjour. Vous avez répété pendant deux ans ces expériences dans le Space Lab ici au Marshall Space Center. Est-ce que ça se passe de la même façon dans l'espace? Uh, at Marshall, uh, le lancement, c'est très bon, mais dans l'espace, uh, le, c'est très difficile de faire des expériences dans la même uh, période de temps, uh, c'est-à-dire... Uh, il faut utiliser beaucoup de temps pour faire des expériences euh, dans l'espace euh, que euh, sur le terre euh, à Marshall. My name is Klaus Walter. I'm asking Ulf Merkel for CDF German TV. Ulf, I first would like to ask you in English and switch to uh, to German. After your first space flight, you spoke of the vulnerability of the planet Earth. Now, well, back into space. What do you think? How can we on Earth? get profit out of the space and the conditions you found there. Wie wir oben im Weltraum vorgefunden haben, Ulf Meerbold, können wir uns auf der Erde denn in der Zukunft einmal zu Nutze machen? I think um, there is um, no question. Um, space flight from my perspective has a lot of uh, potential. First of all, we use space as a unique laboratory and do experiments in all different uh, scientific areas, Earth observation, material science, life sciences, and so on. And all the knowledge gained there uh, will help to make life on Earth better. In addition, space flight uh, requires, uh, let's say, high-tech approaches, for that reason, technology is stimulated. And a classical example of this kind is the Apollo program. I think uh, it stimulated tremendously the development of the integrated circuits, because only very powerful but light and um, um, very reliable computers allowed uh, the Americans to fly to the moon. In addition, there's also philosophical dimension.
for the first time in human history that we have the means in hand to leave the planet. And I think that will change our view. And therefore, there's no question in my mind that space life is important and uh, it would be a tremendous mistake not to do it. This is Daria Robinson of the European Space Agency. I have questions now from our press watching you <coughs> directly from Europe. The first one from Pete Smolder, Dutch space writer of Vara Television. Ulf, almost 10 years ago you made your first space flight. Is there a distinct difference between your personal experience then and now from a psychological and physiological point of view? Now my first space flight was eight years ago. I think um, I'm eight years older, but that makes it easier for me. Uh, Richard Schurman, Dutch space editor, Perth Uni, Svelte Courant, what, to, to Ron Graby, what has been the most exciting and unexpected event during this IML mission so far? Well, the most exciting event uh, for any space flight, I think, really has to be the ascent phase, the first eight and a half minutes. You're uh, really at the focal point of the unleashing of a lot of power, and uh, regardless of what happens after that, that's still got to be the most exciting thing that you're going to experience. Uh, German television again. Uh, Ulf Meerbold, do you think uh, that, in your opinion, should space exploration continue in national programs, or do you see any chance to get more cooperation instead of more competition, uh, even through uh, the costs will be reduced? Oh, my mind is very clear. I'm in favor of uh, cooperation. And I think the IML flight, the flight we are on right now, is a classic example uh, for uh, cooper cooperative programs because uh, we have an international crew. We have experiments from many different nations. And I think uh, that is the way to do it. Was wünschen Sie sich denn von den deutschen Wünschen in Sachen Weltraumpolitik? Muss mehr für die Weltraumpolitik, für die Erforschung des Weltraums in Deutschland auch der Jugend beigebracht werden? Ich glaube, wir brauchen nur eine klare politische Linie beibehalten und zwar in Richtung internationale Beteiligung an Weltraumprogrammen. Another question uh, for Ulf from Ralf Hupers from Raumfahrt Infodienst. After your second experience in space, what advice do you give to future colleagues who will be exposed on Columbus to long duration flights? Well, I think I'm not really in the position to give good advice because. Uh, If I'm lucky, I will spend 18 days in orbit, which is not a very long period of time. Uh, I think uh, the best people to give advice are the Russians. Another question to Ulf Meerwald. Ulf, was war für Sie denn jetzt der größte Unterschied im Gegensatz zu Ihrer ersten Mission? Ja, die, erst, die erste Mission, die ist für mich etwas aufregender abgelaufen als die zweite. Ja, aber ich glaube, das ist immer so im Leben. Das zweite Mal ist dann schon etwas mehr Routine dabei. This is uh, Brian Magruder with the CBS Television Affiliate in Huntsville, Alabama. This is for any of the crew members who've been experiencing the sickness in the rotating chair. Did you have that problem when you attempted the uh, rotating chair on Earth? And Why do you suppose you are experiencing the sickness problems now? Okay, well, somehow I managed to get this one. The, uh, the rotating chair can be a challenge uh, at times, but I think in general we've been able to, uh, to get through most of it. Uh, a lot of folks, probably about two-thirds of folks, are a little bit queasy on the first couple of days. Uh, anytime you're doing any, any motion, it tends to exacerbate it. The chair induces motion, so as you might understand, it also exacerbates any queasiness you're having. Good morning. I'm Kerry Martin from the NBC affiliate here in Huntsville, Alabama. Lieutenant Colonel David Hilmers, I read that you've become fairly uh, relaxed in this uh, 
uh, nauseating motion experience uh, experiment. Um, what is your mindset going into some of these experience, uh, experiments? Are you uh, personally and genuinely interested, or is it more like a giant playground where, where you get to play with the toys, and do you leave the interpretation for the doctors and scientists here on Earth? I have just 